Welcome everyone. I am Laurie Norton Moffitt, Director and CEO of Norman Rockwell Museum, and I am delighted to welcome you to our monthly series of talks about freedom at this very special moment of homecoming of the museum's seven city global touring exhibition, Norman Rockwell, Imagining Freedom. This exhibition and its accompanying programs traverse the nation and toured in France last summer to commemorate the liberation of Europe during World War II, 75, now 76 years ago. Freedom is an aspirational human right so eloquently outlined by President Franklin Roosevelt in his Four Freedoms Address to Congress and later immortalized in the Charter of the United Nations by First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, about whom we'll hear more very soon. On the eve of election season, when we exercise our freedom to elect our government, we are reminded that we must never take for granted our freedoms, that we must always strive for equity and justice for all, especially defending freedom for those who do not have it. Please check the museum's website for the upcoming talks and holiday events, which run through January. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the museum's deputy director and chief curator, Stephanie Habush Plunkett, who served as co-curator of the exhibition. She will introduce our distinguished speakers this evening, three of our scholar advisors who helped to shape the exhibition. Please welcome Stephanie Plunkett. Thank you so much, Laurie, and welcome everybody. We are so happy to have you with us this evening. Um, and we have a wonderful program for you. It's really going to be an inspiring and um, you know, very enlightening conversation. And uh, as Laurie mentioned, our uh, exhibition, our national international traveling exhibition, Norman Rockwell Imagining Freedom, has just opened in the museum gallery. Uh, it's wonderful to have it back home. And um, tonight, our speakers, who are all uh, extraordinary scholars and authors uh, and have been catalog essayists, will be talking about um, this humanity's greatest and most elusive ideals in many ways. What did the four freedoms stand for in their time? What do they mean to us today? 
And I just want to mention that we will greatly look forward to your thoughts on the subject. So as you have ideas and questions, please post them in the chat. And my colleagues, uh, my wonderful colleagues working behind the scenes, Rich Bradway, Mary Burley, and Alyssa Stubel will bring them forward and we'll be able to share them with our speakers. And it is my great pleasure now to introduce our three speakers. Alita M. Black is Hillary Clinton's historian and archivist. And she's also advisor to former Liberian president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. Distinguished visiting scholar at UVA's Miller Center, she is managing director of the Allenswood Group, a collaborative founded to empower individuals and strengthen democracy through civic engagement. Alita is founder of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers Project at George Washington University, and she has written many books on women, politics, and human rights. Her FDR for Freedoms Digital Initiative is a web-based education program dedicated to the four freedoms. D.B. Dowd is an illustrator, designer, and professor of art and American culture studies at Washington University in St. Louis. He is faculty director of the D.B. Dowd Modern Graphic History Library at WashU and has worked closely with us as a leader of the Society of Fellows at the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies. The author and illustrator of Spartan Holidays, his recently released A is for Autocrats uh, and many others. He has written and spoken extensively on published imagery and comics. His book, Stick Figures, Drawing as Human Practice, was published by the Rockwell Center in 2018. James McCabe has been collections manager and curator at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, this is uh, a place that he went to from the Norman Rockwell Museum where he served as guest curator for A Mirror on America, one of the inaugural exhibitions uh, at the newly constructed museum building. He is co-author of Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms, Images That Inspire a Nation, and he has conducted important foundational research on this theme. And with that, I am going to share my screen and um, each of our presenters will be sharing uh, some images and certainly some uh, guiding concepts from the essays that they prepared for the exhibitions catalog. So I will turn it over to uh, my colleague, James McCabe, and we look forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, nearly 30, year, 30 years ago, I had the good fortune to be asked by the Norman Rockwell Museum to serve as guest curator for one of the exhibitions that would be part of the new museum building. My task was to create a show that placed Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms and his subsequent related work into historical context. The result was the exhibition Mirror on America, as well as the co-authorship of the book, Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms, Images That Inspire a Nation. As part of my research, I was able to work with a variety of uncatalogued material that shed considerable light on how the general public engaged with Rockwell's Four Freedoms following their release in 1943. One source from the museum's archive was a massive collection of letters from people around the country written to Norman Rockwell about the Four Freedoms paintings. These letters revealed how profoundly the paintings had affected individual Americans. The other I found in the National Archives it was a summary report about the Four Freedoms War Bond Show, which showed how Americans had responded collectively to the paintings with detailed accounts of, of the show as it traveled from city to city. Together, these sources revealed what a powerful series these paintings were and how the ideas and images of the Four Freedoms came to be such a force in American life during World War II. So when Stephanie asked me if I'd like to write an essay for the catalog for the current show, it was a chance for me to delve into how Rockwell's Four Freedoms played out in my adopted hometown of Detroit. Thanks for that opportunity, Stephanie. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's idea of the Four Freedoms and Norman Rockwell's images came together to create a powerful and compelling tool that was capable of shaping attitudes and driving action on the part of the general public. Very soon after these ideas and images were first brought together in the pages of the Saturday Evening Post in the spring of 1943, 
an unlikely collab collaboration between two longtime adversaries, the United States Treasury Department and the Saturday Evening Post was formed to create the Four Freedoms War Bonds Show, a year long traveling show which used the Four Freedoms to promote the sale of war bonds. War bonds were a critical part of the Treasury's efforts during World War II. Bonds served a number of functions. First, and most obviously, they raised funds for the war effort, and by removing cash from an overheated wartime economy, bonds helped to reduce inflationary pressures on scarce consumer goods. In addition, bonds created a pool of funds that, when mature, could help reignite the post-war economy as it weaned itself from war productions. But bonds also served a non-economic purpose. Because of the purchase of bonds was voluntary, buying a bond represented a shared sacrifice on the part of the purchaser with those fighting overseas. And by extension, a bond purchase was a commitment to the values and the ideas that the war was being fought for. In effect, the bond was an investment in hopes for a particular future. In the case of the Four Freedoms War Bonds show, a bond purchase could be seen as an investment in the idea of the Four Freedoms. So this essay is a look how the, at how this powerful tool, the pairing of the ideas and the images of the Four Freedoms played out in real time in a real place, Detroit, Michigan. Detroit was a city that had been through many cycles of boom and bust with the automotive industry. Its rapid conversion to war production created many serious and deep rooted challenges as well as opportunities. The Four Freedoms War Bond Show was on its eighth stop when it opened in Detroit on September 27th, 1943. At that time, the third war loan campaign was in the last week of its 21 day run and Detroit was struggling to meet its goals for selling the small denomination Series E bonds. These notes, which required a comparatively small investment of $18.75, were targeted toward in ordinary individuals, and their sales were as important as a measure of a community's engagement in the war effort as they were to funding the war. As the arsenal of democracy, Detroit's extensive industrial infrastructure was booming with war production. The accompanying high wages, long working hours, rapid in-migration, overwhelmed public transit, and severe housing shortages put all the elements of the city under severe strain. On June 20th, 1943, these strains and tensions led to fights between gangs of white and black youths on the bridge to Belle Isle, a popular Detroit park. The fights soon erupted into citywide race riots so severe that federal troops were called in to reestablish order. 34 people were killed and 433 were injured. Over 75% of the casualties came from Detroit's black community as the African-American neighborhoods of Paradise Valley and Black Bottom were some of the major battle battleground areas. The city engaged in much soul searching and finger pointing in the weeks and months that followed. Not long afterward, Cyril Kane, the British Council General for Detroit, an astute and trained observer, characterized the state, the state of the city and its collective mindset in a detailed letter to the Foreign Office in London. Along with a description of the many strains the war effort had played, placed on the city, he lamented the attitudes of the citizens. He wrote that the speed and tension of the war industry's work and the influx of money had put Detroiters in a whirl and they cannot find their feet. And more concerning, he said, the majority of the masses are just not interested in the war or its possibilities. Into this, this tense and distracted city, the show arrived in September amidst great promotion and fanfare. It featured Rockwell's paintings accompanied by over a thousand other pieces of original artwork from the post and was housed right downtown in Detroit's landmark J.L. Hudson's department store. A week of advertising preceded the show and it was opened by a massive parade viewed by a crowd estimated at 300,000. Along with the art and artifacts, the show presented daily performances featuring stars from stage and screen, along with a steady coverage by newspapers and radio. Much of the show followed established patterns of war boosterism, such as displays of military equipment, uniforms, artwork of GIs in action, and the like. By contrast, the Four Freedoms paintings and the Bond posters that featured them 
were not the usual win the war slogans. Instead, they were statement, uh, statements about our endangered human rights. The posters called for freedom and speech and freedom of worship, those freedoms already codified in the Bill of Rights to be saved while freedom from want and freedom from fear were part of a vision of a better world, a new world worth fighting for. Rockwell's images were uniquely suited to this role. Under his talented paintbrush and tremendous narrative skills, he built a compelling case for the president's high ideals, not by illuminating their philosophical and political underpinnings, but by portraying them in the familiar settings of everyday life. By, the seeing, by seeing the freedoms in the context of their own lives, Detroiters could recognize them as things to be saved and fought for. The show drove public conversation in the city about the nature of the world being fought for through its programming. Typical was a radio panel discussion on the four freedoms that featured a professor, professor from Detroit's Wayne State University, who was a recent refugee from Germany. He had described how his newspaper, as well as his personal freedoms, had been taken away by the Nazis. An important symbolic statement was part of the show's massive opening day parade. Marching amongst the military service groups, the marching bands, and the political dignitaries was an or organization called the Interracial Group. It had recently been formed by prominent leaders in the African American and white communities following the deadly race riots and it sought to explore ways to address Detroit's deep-seated racial animosities and discrimination. The group's presence in the parade reflected the heightened importance of those concerns. Newspaper coverage by the major Detroit papers was continuous. The Detroit Free Press was particularly strong in its support and praise for the Four Freedoms paintings and the ideas behind them. Along with the daily coverage, an editorial was effusive in its support for the Four Freedoms as an international ideal and as an American obligation, stating, there is a great deal of America in this set of four paintings, yet they are more than American in their appeal. Freedom of speech and freedom of religion are woven deeply into our tradition, are inextricably, inextricably part of our history. Freedom from fear and freedom from want, we have not yet attained in fullness, yet no nation has gone further in making the ideal into reality. The Norman Rockwell canvases have a message for the world, but the message begins here at home. The ideals of the four freedoms had tremendous importance to the aspirations of Detroit's African-American community, but reflecting the deep segregation of the city, they occurred completely separately from the Four Freedoms War Bonds show. The Michigan Chronicle, the weekly newspaper that served the African-American community, frequently had features about the ideals of the Four Freedoms and regularly posted advertisements for the many bond, rally, many bond rallies held in African-American neighborhoods. However, the paper never mentioned the Four Freedoms War Bonds show. The show had the desired effect on Detroit's War Bonds campaign. The popularity of the show led to a surge in war bond sales, which allowed Detroit and Michigan to exceed their quotas for bond sales. And they led the nation in the sale of the small denomination bonds purchased by individuals. In the post-war years, Detroit and its automotive, automotive industry came to symbolize freedom from want as prosperity among its, amongst its new middle and working classes was spurred by a vigorous economy and strong unions. The deprivations of depression and war seemed a long way off for much of its population. However, the challenges presented by Detroit's racial divide had been much tougher to overcome as the uprising of 1967 and the current Black Lives Matter demonstrations have shown. But the Four Freedoms helped to bring those issues into more public discussion at that time and perhaps to serve to move the needle just a bit in an ongoing process that has spanned generations. So today we find ourselves in the middle of a pandemic with no clear endpoint. The virus has in just eight months taken more than half the total number of American lives that were lost during all of World War II. Our civil society appears more deeply divided than ever and seems to be preventing us from taking unified action as a nation. What could be the four freedoms of 2020? Or have we gotten to the point where we can no longer be inspired by such ideals? Thank you. 
Thank you, Jim, for your exceptional work on this project and um, such an interesting and thought-provoking essay. Uh, we can pause here for a moment to see if anyone has any questions or comments uh, or any thoughts from our other panelists on Jim's comments. Jim, I know you did a great deal of research um, to understand uh, the events that occurred in Detroit, uh, both with regard to the war bonds show and um, the race riots that preceded them. Are there, are there aspects of your research that really surprised you or um, you know, presented facts that uh, you had not been aware of before? Um, I think one of the things that struck me, I guess, in some ways, is is a little bit of the circularity of of, of some of these these um, changes and pressures and ideas. You know, much of the language in in the '40s, you know, was brought over brought forward again in during the '60s and '70s as as part of the um, looking at at personal freedoms and those kind of things. But they also had a bit of a change. Um, but the the uh, I guess the thing that really struck me, you know, not being not being from Detroit and uh, kind of learning about more about my city is is I you know I guess I've been here twenty something years now, so I'm I'm <laughs> more Detroiter than anything else these days, I guess. But um, just what a what a total whirlwind the the whole uh, period of the um, war production effort during the Second World War. Um, the, the images of the city and um, of the, just sort of the streetcars just being jammed with people, um, housing being stuck in every nook and cranny, you know, made from the shabbiest stuff because people were coming into the city um, in such a, a massive way. And, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I came into the city during one of its kind of many downturns. And uh, so to, to kind of get a sense of how um, that city was, was so, um, so powerful and vibrant at that time in such a crazy busy place was, was really, you know, it, it helped me, it kind of helped me understand my friends who were from Detroit and talking about kind of how things changed and, and that kind of thing uh, was, was very helpful for me. But, you know, what, you know, Kind of going back to the comments of the governor Cyril Kane, the governor general, you know, it, it what really got me was, you know, here he is talking about this kind of busy and otherwise occupied city that really is like, you know, they're bringing home their money and, and taking care of stuff. But the, you know, the war bond show was a galvanizing factor for them and, and really turned things around. And it, it, you know, it just kind of struck me as to how powerful those sorts of things can really be. You know, we often think of them as, you know, kind of advertising or something like that or propaganda or however you want to characterize it. But in fact, they do have meaning to people. Thank you, Jim. That was a really wonderful response. And we do have another question for you here that has come through from the audience. Um, one of our viewers has asked, I wonder if during this wartime in 1943 in Detroit, if Rockwell couldn't have been asked to create an image of white and black men, <clears throat> women working together and fighting together in the war effort, any thoughts? Um, I will actually just comment um, that there was an integration, an, an interracial group in uh, Chicago that wrote to Rockwell and asked him to do that very thing. Um, and Jim, I don't know if you know of anything in relation to Detroit well, um, not not the, not specifically Detroit, but uh, yeah, I was just going to comment on that. You know, that was that was one of the the great discoveries as I was going through that. I guess it was you know a, a massive box of letters. Was this letter from um, I think his name was you know he's he's I think in the in the exhibition and was in the book. You know, Roderick Stevens saying, you know, we need you, we need you and your skills to help us with this. You know. To get these ideas across, and and you know Rockwell's constraints, of course, working for the Saturday Evening Post, really limited that. And and you know whether that letter was, you know, inspired Rockwell, or he was already thinking about it, and you know some 
you know, 20 years later, he finally decides to, to leave the post and do the work for, po that, for, the, for Look that was so, so tremendously powerful, you know, the, the problem we all live with in other works. Um, I, you know, I, I can't say, but um, um, certainly, you know, he was hearing from all around the country from, from ordinary folks and from people like Walt Disney who are saying, you know, these things are just so tremendously important. Thank you, Jim. And one last question, and you probably can answer this, but I believe we probably both could. Uh, the question is, did Rockwell uh, and Schaefer or other post artists appear in these events? Yeah, well, Rockwell was in the first. And you know, I to be honest, I, I actually don't recall if Meet Schaefer attended them, any of them or not. Um, I was just trying to kind of think through some of the pictures I'd seen. Right. You know, I think Rockwell was just, you know, completely overwhelmed by his the first one in Ro in Washington, and decided he needed to go back to Arlington and and uh, <laughs> right, that's exactly right. Um, I did see in a list of guest um, artists that Meet Schaefer did appear. At oh, did he? Point. Okay. I'm not sure which venue, but he did. I, I mean, it, I mean, <laughs> his, um, I I think actually the his you know his his paintings were in in fact I think. I don't know. Was it, I, anyhow, yeah, his paintings were 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 prominent in the they show, were, so it, it wouldn't were. surprise me that he in fact. And they also it. appear in our exhibition, which is yes, exciting. of course, yeah, yeah. Jim, thank you so much. Wonderful responses, and oh, thank you. More to come. It's now my pleasure to introduce Douglas Dowd. Well, greetings. It's uh, a treat to be here and to be be part of this this exhibition project. <clears throat> uh, you know, if you, if I had thought about this project even 10 years ago, I would have predicted that it, it, it might sort of be a giant bore that we'd, we'd gone through the greatest generation stuff. We'd kind of done the victory lap for the World War II generation and it was kind of time to move on. And what do you know? it turns out that this material remains relevant in unexpected ways. Um, and my, my angle or, or uh, point of entry for, the, for my catalog essay and for this exhibition was really to, to take a kind of art critical approach in the sense that the significance of Rockwell uh, to the World War II effort, the, the, how uh, these images landed with the public and the work that they did is others have done a, a, uh, an impressive job as we've seen of, of exploring that territory. So I kind of wanted to take the, take, raise the question um, and, and this this will uh, possibly uh, create PTSD in, in Rockwellians to just ask the question, are, are these things any good, like as art? Um, now, we all know that by now, Rockwell's place in American art has begrudgingly been recognized. And so I don't think we have to have the argument about whether Rockwell or illustration are important. I mean, some people maybe want to have that argument. I don't want to have that argument uh, because it doesn't, it, it doesn't really go anywhere. So let's assume that it's important let's assume that it did important work, but okay, what, what makes it tick? How is it built? And uh, what are its strengths and weaknesses? I guess that was, that was, my, th that was the way I entered uh, the conversation. One of the things that's really striking about Rockwell when you just look at the methodology over time is how he built these images. He really operated like a kind of filmmaker. He, he did photo shoots for everything. Um, he had models for everything. So there was a, uh, a particularity in everything that he did. But he also had this kind of invisible uh, cartooning activity that because the, because the characters are formed in such a persuasive way, they're, the way they're modeled, uh, the way they're realized as volumes, you don't actually see some of the extra goosing that he does in the way that he finishes the drawing. 
if you look at the the plumber on the left, he's he actually would he would fall over backwards if he were actually in that posture. Uh, and Rockwell's just kind of tipped him backwards a little bit more to get a little more diagonal in that image. So he's a he's kind of an invisible cartoonist while he's also a documentarian. It's a it's a crazy combination, and I think that's part of his appeal. Um, can we uh, see the next slide, please. So, you know, a word about context, the, at the, at the beginning of World War II, there were a bunch of Jewish kids in New York uh, and other cities who were aware of what was happening in Europe and the, the melodrama of uh, the early comics, including Submariner, including Captain America, um, they were given they were given jobs to do in a war effort that the United States hadn't actually started to participate in yet, um, and there's something about that that's quite striking. Yet, it's also kind of, in, in a certain way, disheartening to me at least that here we are many decades later, and a large number of the films that end up in in movie theaters. Uh, are, are still involving comic book superheroes at a moment when our difficulties are not galactic, but uh, 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 the, the challenges of how we live with each other. There's something about our, our there's something sophomoric uh, about the culture of, of, of superheroes at a moment when that's not really what we need. Um, Okay, well, uh, let's move on, sorry. So, a word about just the representation of people at this time. Um, modernism, high modernism, um, had a tendency to generalize the, if you think about uh, you know, Mondrian starts with paintings of trees and houses and ends up with arrangements of rectangles. That analytical energy, which uh, the, the habits of mind that lead us there at this time involve all of the uh, um, Darwin, Freud, Marx, thinkers who were looking below the surfaces of things and looking for unseen dynamics, that that sensibility kind of bleeds over into modernism and to abstraction itself. So we get this in high art, we get a, a simplifying, generalizing abstraction. In advertising, we get a different kind of generalization, which is kind of the swell gals and guys of, uh, of, of capitalism in boom years. So there's a, whether we're, whether we're looking at popular images or we're looking at, uh, uh, I mean, WPA art is, is, is part of the cultural uh, conversation at this point, but abstraction and painting, um, we're, there's this kind of modernist energy. Rockwell is, does literally the opposite. Uh, can, we, can we move on? So I'm just gonna show you a couple of details from the Freedom's paintings. So this is the, um, the Freedom of Speech painting. That, that fragment of a woman's face is the only woman in that painting. It's a, it's a, it's a male uh, county meeting, but the, the, the primary issue here is, Again, look at the particularity of those people. They're not generalized. They're not essentialized laborers. They are, they are people who lived down the street who sat for Norman Rockwell. And that's part of the, to me, what part of the interesting tension of these images is the particularity of the representation, but the generalization of the theme. 
So the and that's and that's what was so hard for Rockwell about these paintings. That's what was challenging for him to make them. And he found a way, I think, in three out of the four, to ground the action in the particularity of people doing real things. Uh, this man, the guy in the blue plaid shirt, as you know, standing to speak uh, at this town meeting in this kind of pregnant moment. Uh, Stephanie, can we go to the next slide? Uh, this little fragment of uh, freedom from want. This is really the only way to look at this painting at this point. Like if you look at the whole painting, you can't even see it anymore because it's been so, it's been so parodied and it, it has lived so many lives that it's very difficult to even see, even when you're looking right at it. And one of, one of the paradoxes of this painting is that this is freedom from want. And okay, there's a big turkey at the end of the table, which looks like it weighs literally like a pound and a half, even though it's gigantic, because that woman held that platter without a turkey on it when he, when he did the photo documentation. Look at the rest of the table. There's no wine, there's no bread. It's, it's like some celery, an aspic, and some fruit. It's actually quite Spartan, which is totally unexpected, but there you have it. And, and, and quite lovely painting. And I mean, Dutch still life uh, sensibility on those salt and pepper shakers. Um, okay, next. and freedom from fear. Now this painting for me is, um, this captures something about Rockwell that um, it, it, it's where he gets hung up. So one of the things about Rockwell that his biographers talk about is his boyish enthusiasm for Charles Dickens. He loved, hearing his father read Dickens out loud. And it was um, those, those stories were near and dear to him. Um, but one of the things that Rockwell shied away from, almost absolutely, are villains. There are no bad guys in Rockwell painting. There are obstacles, there are, there are grumpy old men, or there, you know, there, there are, there are human challenges, but there are not villains. There's no Quilp, there's no Uriah Heep, there's no, um, there's no source of fear. And when you think, think, about, think about Walt Disney, think about how, to, about how scary Walt Disney could be. Like that scene in Bambi, uh, the pink elephants in Dumbo. There, there are a lot, when the, when the boys in Pinocchio turn into donkeys, I mean, there's really scary stuff in Disney. There's not scary stuff in Rockwell. So the, when we're talking about freedom from fear, but the representation of fear is literally typesetting on a newspaper. There's something about that is, I, I, I kept coming back to that, like, wow, what, what, what is that? Um, Okay, so let's move on. There's, um, so this is a late, this is a late Rockwell painting uh, for look, the murder in Mississippi painting. This is the study I think that they actually ran. They didn't like the finished painting. And um, so this is, this is a picture about a murder and the murderers are off screen. So it's like, Think of Goya's executions uh, in May. Imagine that you cropped out the soldiers on the right and you just looked at the people who were gonna get shot on the left. That's effectively what we're looking at. So even when he wants to be very forceful, he can't really show you the bad guy. 
Okay, uh, next. So that I didn't show you a detail from uh, freedom of religion, which for me is the least persuasive of the four freedoms paintings uh, because the characters don't have anything to do. They're, they just stand there prayerfully looking pious and there's no tension, there's no, there's no actual behavior. And so they sort of turn into stickers. I, I just don't I, don't, I don't care for that painting at all. Apparently it was one of Rockwell's favorites. Um, but this painting, I think is Rockwell's best painting in, in, in it, this is the best thing he did in his career in my view. And this is saying grace, um, which if my memory serves, I think went for $54 million, um, uh, a number of uh, years back, um, which would have been unheard of not very long ago. Um, this I think is Rockwell, if Rockwell is squeamish in some ways, if Rockwell is unwilling to tell us bad news or show us bad news, um, he gets the, the specificity of people not quite understanding each other. This is, I, in my view, this is a very powerful image of uh, religion in America because it captures some of the essential strangeness of religion. The idea that we are not of this, we're in this world, but we are not of it. And then the secular crowd around the grandmother and, and grandson, eyeing them warily and curiously, like, what is this? And it, there's, there's a kind of negotiated settlement uh, and an exchange that kind of, we get kind of the sacred and the profane in, 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 in pretty moving ways. Um, I'd take this painting 10 times out of 10 over freedom of religion for that reason. And I guess that's what, you know, coming back to, coming back to this problem of sophomorism, right? Of like, we need to have the, we need to have the giant um, uh, monstrous villain who comes from another galaxy and the tedium of that um, on the one hand, on the other, we're, we're in big trouble right now. We, we have real problems and they, they don't, they don't come from another planet. Uh, although it can feel that way. Um, they're, they're people living relatively close at hand. So maybe what Rockwell has to offer, even if he's squeamish, that what he has to offer is recognition of an essential human decency that he thinks better of us than we deserve. And so possibly he still has something to say to us if we can listen. Douglas, thank you for those. Um just incredibly enlightening comments and just for looking at Rockwell in a new way. Um, I think it opens up so much about him and uh, I agree with you about this painting. This is definitely, I think his one of his most powerful works. Uh, I think we're gonna hold questions until after we hear from Alita. So we will um, look forward to your comments, Alita. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephanie. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm so glad that you decided to listen to us at a seven o'clock on a, on a Friday night or a six o'clock or whatever time zone you're in. Um, I'd like to um, have a friendly little sparring match with uh, 
my great friends, Jim and Doug. Uh, <laughs> you know, Jim would say um, that these were humanity's most elusive ideals. And Doug, you know, questioned whether they were relevant during the middle of the Cold War or whether or not there was any action in um, the freedom of religion paintings or why there were not so, uh, why there weren't any bad guys or bad women in the paintings. Well, I would like to posit, and God knows I am not an art critic, that um, perhaps Eleanor was right when she looked at Rockwell to say that these were visions to challenge us to risk everything we had. And, to, you know, it's easy to say the four freedoms are aspirational ideas, you know, that we will never achieve. Well, if we think they're aspirationals, then we should stop being Americans, we should stop voting, we should just go home shut our doors and not do anything. Because if there is a fundamental call to action in American history, in American society, in something that is before us today, is what, not what we are for or what we are against, but what risks we will take to make what could be a Gazi ideal, um, a revolutionary act. And that's how Eleanor saw the four freedoms. You know, she didn't see them as, she never met Rockwell. She never really uh, attended a Rockwell um, a traveling show. She didn't deliver or help write the four freedom speech. But the images stayed with her in a way that resonated so strongly with her that she continually risked her income and her life to concretize them. You know, when she talked about the four freedoms, she didn't talk about images of tranquil children in bed or turkeys being served, you know, or um, the right to pray. She emphasized the challenging work that it would take America and the world to really address the challenges that FDR meant. Because FDR died before he could really define what the four freedoms meant. What we know for sure are two things. First of all, every time he mentioned the four freedoms, he would say freedom from fear everywhere in the world, freedom from want everywhere in the world, freedom of speech everywhere in the world, freedom of worship and information everywhere in the world. And that required constant struggle constant vigilance and constant negotiation. The only thing he really had some crystal clear vision of is that freedom from fear meant the freedom from atomic devastation. He wanted arms control. The record is very clear on this. So what Eleanor understood the four freedoms to mean was not only a reason to fight the war, but what the qualifying um, parameters of a successful peace would be. Eleanor was haunted by World War I. You know, she uh, traipsed the burned out bloodied fields of Bella Wood, she worked with shell-shocked soldiers and sailors who were trapped in straight jackets in their own feces. She saw the demise of Woodrow Wilson's um, political acumen and vision 
uh, succumb to petty politics in a way that totally turned the war to end all wars and the wars to make the world safer democracy into a return to normalcy, a height of American nativism, increased racism and the uh, revitalization of anti-Semitism and the Ku Klux Klan and the onslaught of the Great Depression. So she entered World War II determined not only to win the war, but win the peace. And that meant we had to somehow concretize what the four freedoms meant. And she became increasingly irritated with Harry Truman in the early days of his presidency because he was totally inconsistent. Jim, you know, you were talking about um, the Detroit race riot. Both the New York Times and the Mississippi Press blamed Eleanor Roosevelt for the Detroit race riot because she organized with the great labor leader, Walter Ruther, for whom she had so much respect that I believe she wanted him to run for president. And what was their biggest concern? freedom from want in Detroit. There were black families living in tents made of newspaper in snow covered parks that were to be relocated into a 24 unit federally built housing project for black workers. Um, it was called the Sojourner Truth Project. The race riot resulted because of that. The 24 families were met with the congressman from New York, I mean, from Detroit with that community with one inch red pipes wrapped in barbed wire and baseball bats with 10 penny nails driven through them. Shadows of the freedom rides in the South. So Eleanor very much understood that there would be a massive struggle for, to implement the four freedoms in the United States as well it would be to implement them around the world. She would say, when the war is over, we simply will have dominated the more aggressive enemies. At all times, day by day, she wrote, we will have to continue fighting at home and abroad for freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. And these are to be gained in peace as well as war. So let's fast forward, FDR's dead. Um, Eleanor had hoped uh, and had planned to accompany him to San Francisco for the founding meeting of the United Nations. But that doesn't happen because he dies 10 days before he's supposed to be, they're supposed to leave. She um, retreats to Hyde Park to manage the estate, to give the platform really to her children. But there is such unrest in the United States that she can no longer be quiet. And she begins to speak out in August and September about the issues of freedom from want, food, shelter, a living wage, health care. She argues that you cannot separate, you cannot divorce freedom from want from freedom from fear. And so when Harry Truman appoints her to the first American delegation to the United Nations, she takes this gut level commitment with her to London to help the world begin a full throttle debate over what the four freedoms mean. To her, they are not gauzy ideals. They are the essential building blocks of society. And to prevent war, to build a stable and secure world, you must figure out 
how to feed, clothe, shelter, educate, protect, embolden, and respect difference. Otherwise, World War III would be right around the corner, just as World War II was 20 years after the First World War. Only this world, the Third World War, would be more vicious. It would have the atomic bomb. It would have unimaginable destruction. A gazillion Dresdens, um, Dresdens, you know, uh, repeated bombings of London, repeated Hiroshima's, and repeated holocausts and concentration camps. And so when Eleanor ends up being the point person unexpectedly for 40 to 60 million displaced persons in Europe. I want to say that again, 40 to 60 million displaced persons. We freaked out, Europe freaked out when there was 1 million of refugees in Europe. Her standing within the world because of the risks that she took and her successful debate to support refugees and displaced peoples in the shadows of the Cold War leads her to be appointed to the first um, uh, commission that the UN created to deal with human rights. And what comes out of her service to that committee is the first document in the history of civilization from the beginning of time until 1948. The first document to say all human beings are born free and, free and equal and endowed with reason and conscience. Men, women, children, all nationalities, all races, all religions, all incomes. That had never happened in the history of the world. Then there are 29 other articles that follow that, which now have been used as a model for more state constitutions and more national constitutions than our own Bill of Rights and our own const the, the US Constitution. And the four freedoms are integral to this. Eleanor accepted this position, being a non-lawyer, being the only woman on the American delegation to win the peace and prevent another war and to help the world and individual nations become more secure. And the key to Eleanor in this struggle was the refusal to separate want from fear. She fought the State Department to win that argument. She convinced her arch rival, the Republican John Foster Dulles, to support this position when they go to meet with George Marshall. So the four freedoms to Eleanor were not just Gazi ideals. They were strategies and goals that directed the policies that communities and governments and NGOs and the United Nations must develop. I mean, she said today, I, I would like to close um, um, with one quote from Eleanor that I think sort of sums up everything um, that I've tried to say. And this is when she submits the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to the General Assembly for adoption in December 1948. They had over 178 meetings that lasted over 3,000 hours, and they negotiated more than 200 resolutions to whittle down to these final three. And she had to convince America that rights were both social, economic, and cultural, and the Soviets not to object 
to political and civil rights. So as she introduces this world-changing document, she says, we have to do, we have so much to do to fully achieve and to assure these rights set forth in this declaration. But having them put before us with the moral backing of 58 nations will be a great step forward. As we here today bring to fruition our labors on this Declaration of Human Rights, we must at the same time rededicate ourselves to the unfinished tasks which lie before us. And every time I see the Rockwell paintings, and it took me a while to get to this point because they're all white and they're all safe. But what I see in these paintings is the same thing that I see in Ruby Bridges, the same thing that I see in Murder in Mississippi, the same thing that I see in the Golden Rule. And that is without courage to believe the world can be better, why the hell are we here? Thank you. Alita, thank you um, for those incredible comments, uh, which provide such uh, context for all of this and tremendous passion, which we so appreciate. Uh, I am actually going to stop sharing my screen so that everyone can see our speakers. And we do have um, some wonderful comments and questions. So I believe that there are two audience members who are ready to ask their questions in person. Um, and so I'll invite uh, Mary Burley to get Laura Curley and Jean Aaron uh, ready to ask in person. So, perfect. Jean, if you want to start, Jean, if you would like to start, that would be great. Thank you, Jean. We'd love to hear your question. Hello. Do you see me? Hi there. Hello, everybody. Hi, Jean. Hey, Jean. <laughs> I really enjoyed all this. Everybody was terrific. Uh, I asked a lot of questions. I'm a big question asker, but I'm wondering uh, if the uh, I know this is historical, but how about the Rockwell Museum kind of embrace the digital age and these tumultuous times that we're in and engage young artists, black, white, brown, green, whoever, uh, to kind of reflect what's going on today in America, uh, the things that can bring out the best in all of us. So I just kind of throw that out there. It gives all these ideals, which were wonderful in their day. They were all very white. Uh, but, you know, then he rose to the occasion probably when he was allowed to, maybe in the civil rights era. But how about today? What can Rockwell do? To I, can I know? answer that? Is that okay? Yes. I want to give, yes. <laughs> I, I give a huge shout out to... Um, Lori and Stephanie and Mary and Rich um, and the other team at the Rockwell Museum. They have launched an extraordinary digital project that's called the Unity Project. And you can't see my necklace, but I wore it because of that. The whole thing is about contemporary interpretations of the four freedoms by young artists on how to vote. I mean, Secretary Clinton loved it so much she retweeted it. They are doing exactly this. And Jean, I would quibble with you, my new brave friend, uh, if I may, on one point. I mean, the paintings may be all white, but the ideals are universal. There is no color overlay on the freedom from want. There is no cover lay over on freedom from fear. They are as viable in Nigeria as they are in uh, Utah. They, and, you know, everybody today is grappling with, look at the lines in food banks. 
Look at the concern over evictions. Look at the concern over protecting voting rights. Look at access to the vaccine. Those are all integral to the four freedoms. End the sermon. Well, I would say that now that it's touching white folk, it's much more meaningful. But I think it's important that particularly in America, which is turning quickly brown and black and yellow, I happen to have a yellow daughter <laughs> adopted from Vietnam. Uh, it's, we need good imagery that reflects everybody. Oh, no, and I, I wanted to mention to you, um, thank you for that comment. Uh, it's very important. And Alita, thank you for your response on the Unity Project. Um, when we were preparing the exhibition, we actually put out a call for entries to all artists to invite them to create contemporary considerations of the theme of freedom uh, or of Rockwell's Four Freedoms. We actually wound up getting about a thousand responses, which was really exciting. Um, 38 of those images are in the exhibition and they deal with a very wide range of contemporary subjects, everything from race to um, uh, women's rights and um, where you can see one on the bottom right by Pops Peterson. Pops um, actually has a much larger display at the museum now where he has actually reimagined uh, Rockwell's Four Freedoms as well as uh, a number of other paintings from contemporary, uh, from a really contemporary point of view. So we agree with you. I think the um, notion of inviting artists to think about what freedom and the four freedoms mean today uh, was a very important project of the museum. And I love your idea of putting it out to students as well. Uh, we have worked with local school groups, um, one from Albany who actually has done a series of exhibitions with us on their takes on the four freedoms. So um, I think as they, Alita, Alita said- they the, display at the museum now? They are, and okay. we would love to have you come see them. And I'm they're also featured on the museum's website. So good. You, can, you can get to see all that. And I, we okay. thank you for that question, Jean. Thank you. Wonderful comment. Uh, I think there is someone else um, queued up to ask a question. And uh, Laura, would you like to ask your question? We may have lost Laura. I think we lost her. Okay, no problem. Um, uh, there is a question for Douglas from Rebecca Wiggle. Uh, the question is, what other Rockwell images do you um, feel connected to besides saying grace? Well, Doug, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. Um, so he, I mean, he clearly has distinct periods, right? So there, the, there's the period before, before World War II, uh, the, the number of pictures that have like full environments is relatively minimal. And it's really after the war or during, and then after the war where you get these kind of more fully realized environments. And so, and, the, and those later pictures tend to have more social um, sensibility about them. And so some of those I like a lot. I love the, the TV antenna, the TV, TV antenna that's higher than the cross on the than church. The church, yeah, yeah, I love yeah. that one too. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, he, his, he captured longing really well. Um, the leaving home image, uh, um, uh, double tank, which is early forties, which is so smart. The, the with the girls reading the magazine and the, the face on the magazine becomes her face. Um, uh, so I, I, I like a lot of them. You know, there's a question that came in. Um, thank you, Douglas. I, I agree with a lot of your a lot of your takes on those. Uh, that came in that might be suitable for Jim because um, the question was how did Rockwell come up with the four freedoms concepts and and Jim um, you used to live in Arlington Vermont where Rockwell was living when he created the paintings and I wondered if you want to say something about the the uh, concept that launched the series 
which of course was based in Arlington. Sure. Um, uh, the the uh, the freedom the the scene from Freedom of Speech was kind of the the kind of captures the the, the spark that that got Rockwell going on on how he was going to handle the four freedoms. Um, you know, he had you know he talked about sort of reading the four freedoms and looking at the Atlantic charter and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and he, you know, he could just never get any traction, but um, in, he attended a, a town meeting um, in Arlington and this was, um, you know, Arlington's, uh, you know, was a small farming town in a, uh, <laughs> in a state where it's not really very easy to farm um, in Vermont. And uh, so it's, it was not really a wealthy town. They had, it had its share of people who had moved in like Rockwell and Schaefer from, from outside. But anyhow, um, the, the uh, school had burned down. The, the, the high school had burned down and they were having a meeting about what, what to do um, about replacing it. And um, they were looking at, you know, um, assessing some taxes and, and uh, to to uh, to build a new school, and um, one of Rockwell's neighbors, who lived about a mile down the road from him, and he subsequently moved right next door to him. But his name is Jim, Jim Edgerton. Stood up and um, basically argued against it, and and you know for um, for a community that that valued its education, and 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 they clearly did. Um, this was this was not an easy stand to take, and and uh, um, and I when, you know as Rockwell saw him stand up and talk, and and then you know he was sort of respectfully respectfully listened to, and and uh, you know he realized at that moment that you know there it is that's that's freedom of speech, and and uh, you know he started to run he <laughs> he he ran from there and worked worked from there, and then uh, you know tried to look for the freedoms in daily life and in subsequent work. I, I, you know, you can tell from the studies to kind of get back to your point of freedom of worship, uh, the, that he really struggled with that one. And, you know, the early studies show, you know, he started, I think it was started out with something in a barbershop and things like that. And I, I think in the end, you know, just putting the sort of uh, even, even shading over all of the, the, the folks, different folks, from different religions um, being thoughtful in what, whatever way that happens to be was his best, I think his best take on that. Thank you, Jim. Sure. There's a question in the chat. Um, let's see, I wonder if anyone would like to comment on the conflicts and implications of freedom of speech today uh, and whether Rockwell's notion of freedom of speech reflects the nuances of um, free and fair debate. Would anybody like to take that? Um, well, I, I guess I'll jump in only to say that Rockwell's representation of people having a meeting in real time and space uh, makes it far more likely that the way that conversation will be conducted is uh, it has a it has a better chance of being respectful than if it's occurring shielded by anonymity yeah. uh, and not not taking place in in real space and our difficulties with free speech in part um, are coming from the way that we're shielded from uh, the pain our words can cause and we can go and hide behind our battlements. And so the, I mean, the, what, I mean, there's something, there's something slightly patronizing about that painting for me is cause that guy, I mean, there are like three older guys in suits and ties nearby kind of looking at him in a, this very friendly, but kind of patient way. And you kind of know they're going to call the shots. It looks like they're going to call the shots, but he's going to get to say his thing. But nonetheless, that's happening in in a real place, and and our problems with free speech right now seem to partly be structural and technological. 
Yeah, thank you, Douglas. Um, so true. And in fact, uh, with regard to that painting, it is the only one of the four freedoms that was inspired by an actual event in an actual place. Let's see, we have a couple of other questions. Um, Douglas, uh, I'm sorry, Jim, there's a question with regard, uh, and Alita, you might want to uh, consider this as well. Uh, there's a question about whether um, there was conflict that arose in Detroit because of uh, Henry Ford's attitude, attitudes towards, uh, towards Jews. Mm -hmm. Jim, do you want to take it or do you want me to take it? <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the challenges with Henry Ford and, 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 his, and his feelings about um, Jews is a, is a really complicated and, and, and involved story. And Ford was, a, you know, a hugely contradictory and, and uh, complex guy. Um, and, you know, in many ways, his, 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 you know, he has the kind of mid Midwestern sensibility about, about bankers um, and, and the financial community as being kind of predatory on, on ordinary folks. And, you know, had, had, and then from there kind of runs, well, and most bankers are Jews and they're, therefore I'm, you know, I'm going to go after them. And, and that, you know, he was hardly alone in that, in that kind of thinking. But um, similarly, he had, you know, you know, kind of in private, he was very charitable in, in many different ways uh, to people, of, you know, Jews, African Americans, and 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 a whole range of other kind of marginalized groups. And um, you know, being at the Henry Ford Museum, we we deal with this question all of the time. And uh, um, you know, there are certainly choices that Henry Henry Ford made through his life that that. You know, I'm sure today he, you know, would think otherwise of doing. Um, but um, I think I've kind of wandered off from the question. <laughs> to, well, I, can I jump in for a Yeah, minute? why don't you save me on this? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think he was one of the most anti-Semitic people of his era. If you look at his work... Um, right when the um, Model T and other things were coming out and workers were trying to organize <laughs> in the early days of unions. Yeah. It just wasn't bankers, it was unions. Yeah. And, yeah. and, um, and he is vicious yeah. toward Walter Ruther. I mean, vicious, talks about him having Jew blood. He called Franklin Roosevelt, Rosenfeld, in um, in the early days, um, he um, he there early discussions um, about Mein Kampf in there. So I would argue that like Walt Disney, who actually gave money to Hitler and was a leading donor to um, to um, the Nazi Party that these people are incredibly complex. And one of the, um, the big debates that happens leading up to the Detroit race riots are um, they are automatically lumping Detroit Jews in with um, uh, black people who had black workers who had moved to Detroit to work in the defense industry. Yeah. And a lot of the attacks on Eleanor that come out of that resurrect the Rosenfeld feel to it. So it's a really complicated, volatile yeah, story. It yeah, it is. Well, we thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, do our panelists have any closing comments? We were so pleased to have everyone with us and the interesting questions that you posed uh, were well, terrific. I'd like to say oh, something. Yes, I'd oh, just like to say to people, I love this museum. I mean, I live in Arlington, Virginia. It's a six hour drive to get there. I went and I thought, oh Lord, I'm gonna go see these white paintings. 
and everybody's going to strip the four freedoms of their power. And I went there and I saw um, ripped apart in a most informative and gracious way the prejudice that are the stereotype that I had uh, imposed on top of Norman Wachau. I think it is a magnificent place. I think they've raised issues that few other um, museums dedicated to one person would address. I think their education program is spectacular. And I, I'm just so very, very, very glad that it's there. And I rarely say that about art museums. Well, I we really thank you for that. Place. Thank you, Alita. Thank you for that wonderful closing thought. Um, I just have to say it's that worth, our commentators, like Douglas, thank you. <laughs> Well, I have to say that it has been an honor and a pleasure to work with you three uh, for years now, literally, uh, on this and other projects. And um, really the, the commentary that you have brought to the subject of the Four Freedoms has been incredibly meaning and illuminating. And if anybody wants to read their full essays, uh, they are contained in our wonderful catalog uh, and we'd be happy to send them to you. So we thank you again for joining us tonight. It was really a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and we hope to see you again soon. We have programs coming up. Please visit nrm.org <laughs> and yes. vote. Vote, vote, vote. <laughs> vote, <That's right>. vote. <laughs> thank you very much. Just Beth. a few more days. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Douglas. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure enjoyed thank it. Take Have care, a great everybody. evening, everybody. Good luck, everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks for